Hello and welcome to the YouTube channel, the Alabama Renaissance Fair. Today's special guest will be Lee Freeman, the Art of the Sword. Stay tuned in a few seconds and we'll jump right into that. Thank you. Hey, welcome back to the Alabama Renaissance Fair channel. As I said, today's special guest is Lee Freeman, the Art of the Sword. Today I want got some questions ready for you. Okay. I wrote them down because there's quite a few as you can tell and I didn't want to forget something because this is very important for Renaissance fairs, for collecting and everything. So let me jump right into it. Okay. In movies and TV shows, they look very heavy. Some of them, I do know they are very heavy in real life. How strong do you need to be to actually use these swords? Well, that's a good, very good question, Chris, because a lot of people think that medieval swords were very heavy and cumbersome, when in actual fact, um, they're very light. Like, feel this sword, hold that one. That weighs about two pounds, because swords were custom forged for the man that was going to wield them. So they're custom designed for his height and weight. So the average medieval sword weighs between two and three pounds. That one weighs about two pounds. And, I could chop a small tree down with it if I wanted to, but it's light enough that you can swing it all day and it's not going to get hurt. So actually, uh, a lot of medieval swords had, uh, had uh, were, most medieval swords were custom made for the warrior that was going to wield them. So they're not heavy at all. You can swing them all day and not get tired. I was wondering about during battles, all the armor, the weight. Yeah. Well, uh, and that, that brings up another uh, myth, what I like to call myth conception. You see the ubiquitous sword fighting in, yes. in uh, medieval movies, which is also not done because uh, these swords are, are tools, basically. You don't want to mess up your tool, so they're not designed, you know, to do fencing. Ha. You know, they're, they're designed to maim and kill people as efficiently as possible. Um, rapiers, the long, thin swords that they started manufacturing at, you know, in the 1500s, at the end of the medieval period, those are designed for uh, sword fighting. But these swords, these early swords, are designed for hacking or slashing. So they've got the blade designed for that. Well, I see a lot of uh, Renaissance Bears YouTube videos. They These blades are thought of let's do this for an hour because we're Earl Flynn and we're in a movie. Yeah, a lot of the reenactors have custom-built swords that are made for theatrical sword fighting, but I know from experience the real swords are not designed for blade-to-blade -blade sword fighting, so that's one of those Hollywood myth conceptions that uh, you can really mess your sword up if right. you do that. And they are expensive. Yeah, it will, it, will nick, it will nick the blade. Now, something I've noticed, and what is the proper name, because on, on movies... You know, I've seen it go in, the blood runs down the groove. Oh, yeah, the, the fuller. That's another myth conception that this channel down the length of the sword is designed to help the blood run down. Actually, it's designed purely to lighten the blade, yet give it strength. It has nothing to do with a blood groove. I don't know where that even came from. But uh, it's purely to lighten and strengthen the blade. But you'll notice not all of these swords on the table even have fullers. Uh, this sword is a replica of a sword carried by the English knight, Sir John Fastolf, in 1415 at the Battle of Agincourt. He was the inspiration for Shakespeare's character uh, in his play. Uh, this sword has, I don't know if you can see that on the camera, but it's got a diamond-shaped bl uh, blade designed to it. Uh, and it's got this raised bar running down the length of the blade on either side. The, uh, these swords are called cut and thrust swords by modern academics. They're designed to cut and hack, but also to poke and thrust. So the diamond shaped blade helps you to do that, to poke through the plate armor that was replacing chain mail. And then this ridge, this bar gives it reinforcement. Okay. But it's still light enough that you can swing this all day and not get tired. Now is that one Yes, it is. It, it's sticking out or sticking in? Oh, it's a, it's, a, it's a raised bar going down either side that reinforces the blade. So when you 
stick it in through plate armor, it's not going to fold up and break. Okay. Because that one was sunk in and this one's raised. Yeah, this is a fuller. This channel down this blade is a fuller. This, I'm not exactly sure what this bar is called, if it even has a name, but they call this type of sword the cut and thrust sword. Okay. I'm looking at some others. Now, what's. Have you got any. You want to go by your questions? Okay. So you've referred to this tools. What kind of else? Well, they are tools. Different kinds of swords are designed for different kinds of work. They're all primarily designed to kill somebody, but they are designed to do different things, like the hacking and thrusting with, or the hacking with these early medieval swords, and then the piercing and cutting with the later medieval swords by 1415, so that by the time you get up to the mid 1530s, with the German mercenary landsnet soldiers. You have swords, and the real ones are the authentic ones are about six feet long. This is a short version. So these were designed uh, and carried, they were carried by German mercenary landsnet soldiers called Doppelsoldner. They got double pay, these 200, you know, pound, six foot tall German and Swiss guys. Their job was to run out when battle was joined, yelling in German, you know, a big line of them running down the battlefield to chop down the flagpoles and standards of the opposing army. Okay. So, and it's it's designed for intimidation. Okay. It does look like you know, the crisp blade for the dagger, is it? Yeah, uh, they probably thought that a curvy blade did more damage. It really doesn't. It's primarily the intimidation factor. If you've got a line of 20 or 30, 6 foot tall, 200 pound Germans running at you with these screaming, I'd probably run the other way. Right, most people probably would. So that's called a lance neck flamberge. The blade style is called flamberge. Okay. Did any other countries use this or just the Germans? Well, it was, it was primarily the German and Swiss mercenaries. That was part of their tactics. Okay. So that's what that sword is from the 1530s. And the real versions are six feet long. How do you classify the swords? Now, that's another really good question. A lot of people, and I thought this myself when I first got into swords, that you classify swords by the hilt style. But actually, uh, you don't do that at all. Modern academics classify swords by blade type. Uh, um, an academic named uh, Ewart Oakshot, who at his death in 2002 was the world's foremost authority on swords, and actually authored this book, the uh, Sword in the Age of Chivalry, which is one of the two best books on medieval swords that I've ever read. He came up with a classification system that numbers the sword blades because uh, a different, I mean, a, a given sword might have three or four different hilts put on it or handles and cross pieces because these were often passed down from father to son, from father to son. So over a hundred years, a sword might have multiple grips put on it. So if you're going by the grip, how do you know if it's original or not? You go by the blade style. Okay, that makes a lot of sense there. So if you, and I think we've got a graphic of the oak shot chart. You know, you can line up each of these swords other than the flamberge because it's not represented in that chart. On that oak shot chart and determine which type of sword it is. I think it goes from 1 to like 25 or something. What about the cost? How much do they cost? Now, that, that's another interesting uh, question that people uh, pontificate on a lot who have really not ever taught, uh, studied it. And I got a little bit of a cheat sheet right here because I didn't want to forget this. But an inventory of goods stolen from the English uh, nobleman John de Swinerton in 1324 lists war swords as costing three shillings four pence, which is less than two days' wages for a knight or 20 days for a man-at-arms or foot soldier at the lower wage rate. Interestingly enough, longbows went for more money. They were valued at twice the price of the sword. The grant to these were probably the no-frills swords with no ornamentation. But since a warrior had to trust his lot to them, they're, they're not going to be poorly made. But if your price range is not that high, you could buy a cheap sword off the rack for a little bit cheaper price. In the 1340s in England, a cheap sword cost six pence, but a good serviceable blade cost one shilling or two shillings, with the scabbard and the belt being an additional one shilling. And in medieval England, 12 pence equaled one shilling, and 20 shillings made a pound. So, you know, 
fairly expensive, a couple of days wages for a night, but not as expensive as a modern sports car. And like I said, generally swords were custom made, but you could, if you don't have you know enough money, you can go in and buy one off the rack. It won't be quite as nice as a nobleman sword, but it will get the job done. Okay. You had mentioned different parts of the sword, so let's... Uh, another another right. excellent point. Yeah, we talked about the fuller already, and I mentioned the hilt. But just to use this longsword as an example, this blade would, and here's the blade, obviously. The fuller runs down the length of the blade. Then we've got the cross guard, or hilt. And these swords are in the shape of a cross because we're in Christian Europe. So they they use that as symbology. And you've got the, le uh, the grip, which is leather-wrapped, uh, it goes over the grip, uh, and then you've got the pommel, which this is in the shape of the tea cozy. On some swords, or like this falchion, the pommel is round. The pommel, uh, you can, uh, it counterbalances the weight of the sword. It can also be used as a weapon. You can beat somebody up against the head with this. And in some of those 15th century German fighting manuals, sword manuals, they taught warriors how to use every part of the sword as a weapon. Since you're not doing blade-to-blade -blade combat uh, because it'll damage the sword, you can utilize the sword in lots of other ways. So you've got the grip, uh, and, and I, I didn't mention the tang. The tang is a piece of metal. The blade and the, and the tang are one continuous piece of metal. So the tang runs up through the handle, and it's covered with leather and then wrapped. And then the pommel goes on. It's usually welded on there, but sometimes they're just screwed on there. Now on this sword over here, this flamberge, it's got these two arms on either side. These are called parrying guards. So it trips up the other guy's sword and you can parry it and deflect it if you get in a fight. You know, if you do engage in hand-to-hand -hand sword play with those swords. You had mentioned the cross, and I said, that one's really easy to see that, yeah. one, the way it was designed. Yeah, so they, they uh, took that and Christianized the symbology. Now medieval knights, what are they make? Do they do the swords, the belts, because you see all of this put together? Well, they, uh, they, they used several different kinds of weapons. They used axes. Uh, some knights favored these kinds of swords called falchions, which may be based off of eastern scimitars. Uh, some knights favored war hammers. It just depended on the knight and which uh, because knights were the professional soldiers in medieval Europe. They had mercenaries, which were soldiers for hire, or freelancers, because they didn't know feudal service to any lord, so they were freelancers. But generally, the knights are the professional soldiers. They can afford the best equipment. But it just varies on what kind of, uh, which which weapon the knight favors. Did they do, who made the, like, the belts? Uh, well, they're, they're custom made. You'd have a leather worker that would make the belts. You have a smith that would make the swords and the chainmail and the armor. It's okay. all it's all custom made. Okay. Now what about for carrying for the swords? What should we do as as a collector? Well, rule number one is never touch a sword blade. Now why why would that be rule number one? Let's say your oils from your body. Exactly. Cut yourself. That might be the obvious reason if they're sharpened, but the acid on your fingers will corrode the metal over time. Now what about say you're doing during battle, you're not supposed to touch the blade, but you're in battle touching the other person. Yeah, well, in, in battle, that's sort of unavoidable. So what you do is after the battle, you have your squire wipe everything down good and oil it. So these are all real functional recreations of swords, except for these two. Uh, so I have to oil my swords down at least once a month to make sure they don't rust. So you can get machine oil does a good job, or you can get WD-40. Okay, what in Europe? Is it the rust? Because here where we're at, we have a lot of humidity. It just depends on where you are and how high the humidity is, uh, how, how often you have to wipe them down. The best way to store them is just wrap them up in a towel and store them. You don't want to keep them in the scabbard because that traps the oils and the moisture that may be in there. So you just wrap them in a towel and, and store them. One thing I didn't mention that you said a moment ago, uh, if a sword is really heavy, like this one, feel that one. And it's got a lot of frills. It's probably what they call a wall hanger, which means it's only good for hanging on the wall. This is a, a replica of an authentic medieval sword, the state sword of Ferdinand and Isabella of Spain, 
but it's so heavy and it's not forged or tempered. So if you try to fight with this, it's going to break. Okay. So that's why they call those wall hangers. So the really heavy swords are purely decorative. And you can test this out by chopping a cinder block. What is the words right there? Oh, yeah. Uh, this is uh, a sword called the Ulfberg sword, which, uh, according to tradition, a smith named Ulfberg in northern Europe, maybe uh, the Scandinavian areas, maybe an Anglo Saxon, maybe an Anglo Saxon smith. Uh, this is the this is the transitional sword from Viking swords to true medieval swords. Viking swords were pattern welded. These, this is the, an example of the first forged sword created supposedly by this smith named Ulfberg who inlaid his name, I don't know if you can see that on the camera, Ulfberg into the sword blades. So they've got historical versions of this sword they found, you know, a dozen or so all over northwestern Europe. So this is the name of the smith, Ulfberg, that created this particular sword. And, and I got this from Museum Replicas. I was, my question is, where all do you get, is it just one place only, or where do you get them from? Well, you can't just walk in Walmart and say, hey, I want to look at your medieval sword collection. There are some online sites that, that uh, do sell them. Uh, most of my swords came from Museum Replicas. Um, they're located in Conyers, Georgia. They sell windless steel craft swords. Like, these are windless steel crafts, and their prices are reasonable. Uh, oftentimes, they'll have sales. They're just over in Atlanta. They've got a great catalog in an online site. The customer service is good. There's another site called Cult of Athena that also sells a variety of different swords by different armories. They have Windless. They have Dupika. They have uh, Whitehall. They have Albion. They've got swords from it for every price range on Cult of Athena, and that's Cult with a K, K-U-L-T of Athena. Their prices start from like 50 or 80 bucks all the way up to like 1200 So there's literally something for everybody's price range. And I'm drooling over one now that's like priced at $1,200. And I see, is that wood right here? Yeah, the, the, scabbard, the scabbards are generally wood wrapped with leather. And the belt goes through here. Uh, with this one, this belt is actually called a double wrap belt. Because you can double wrap it around yourself. You want to try that on? I don't know. I think you're right-handed. So you're going to have a lot of extra room here. Yeah. What this does is it evenly distributes the weight. They call it a double wrap because it wraps around you double, and it more evenly distributes the weight of the sword on both hips. So all of these online companies sell accessories like the belts. Okay. Well, thanks for stopping by. And if you buy any more swords, you can come back and... And we'll play with some more do that. Thanks for stopping by guys and we had a great time today and please if you have any questions or comments leave them below and we will answer them as quick as possible and don't forget to hit the subscribe button and ring the bell and I thank you so much and please share that way we can all get more information and learn a lot of more knowledge. Thanks so much and we'll see you next time. Bye bye.